Welcome to Cheers. I'm your host, Avery Woods. Holy shit, I'm by myself. (laughs) Hi guys, welcome back to Cheers. Welcome to the first Avery Woods solo episode. I never really planned on doing solo episodes. I feel like I share enough of my life on other social media platforms, but a lot of you guys were giving feedback on Spotify or YouTube or in my Instagram DMs, TikTok comments, whatever the case may be, that they want to know more about me. And I mean, it is my show, just kidding, but I wanted to start off on my first solo episode by doing a QA. and a So we asked on Spotify as well as my Instagram stories, and I think I had around 27,000 questions asked. So I tried to narrow them down as much as I could. There was obviously a ton of repeats, just a lot of the same general questions. But our plan is to do some more solo episodes. So we'll make them about a certain subject, maybe how I transitioned from nursing to social media full-time or parenting advice or breakup advice, marriage advice, friend breakup advice. Scotty and I have kind of bounced ideas back and forth, but I wanted to start the first solo episode by doing a Q&A. So I have my phone with me because I screenshot a bunch of questions and we're going to go through them. And if you know me or you followed me for a while, then you know I'm an open book. And I really don't care what people ask me. I will always be open and honest because I would rather be my true authentic self and you love me for that than me lying and you loving me for that and not the person that I am. So, and if you don't like me or don't like my questions and that's okay, we're just not meant to be besties, but there's nothing wrong with that. People choose to follow who they want to choose to follow because they like those people. So hopefully you like me if you're here. (laughs) Okay, let's get started. Oh, first of all, I didn't want to drink anything besides water today. To be totally honest with you, when I drink anything else, I get so burpy and bubbly. And because I'm the only person talking today, I figured I would just drink water. So cheers. I got my big ass tumbler full of ice water. And if you know me, I'll probably start chomping on ice in a little bit. Ah, It's delicious. Okay, here we go. I honestly didn't really read... (laughs) too much of these in detail or think about how I was going to answer them. So we're kind of just going to wing this together. First question, when and how did you get into social media slash influencer business? I'm in college right now and your journey makes me want to reconsider what I might want to do. So it's so funny because I just don't have a typical story when it comes to starting on social media. I also didn't start it thinking it would become anything or I would make a living off of it. I, as many of you guys know, I'm still a registered nurse. I'm not working as a nurse anymore. I do social media full time, but I am an RN and that's the only career I ever wanted. I told my dad when I was two years old, we have a home video of me saying I wanted to be a nurse because my dad would watch those like ER reality shows And I was obsessed with them. And they were like blood and guts and all this nasty shit. And as a little kid, I thought it was so cool. And so I always knew I wanted to be a nurse. I never changed my mind. I got into nursing school when I was, say, 19 or 20. And during that time, I had a private Instagram. It had about 300 followers on it. And I was like, I'm going to share my nursing school journey. Like, mine as well. Like, I thought... Oh my God, you guys, when I got my first set of scrubs, which was my school uniform, by the way, and the ugliest fucking thing I've ever seen in my life, I wanted to sleep in that. I wanted to do, I wanted, I would purposely go to the grocery store, like after nursing school would get out and I'd go buy my groceries because I knew people would start being. So I was like, yeah, I'm in scrubs. Like, what's it to you? So (laughs) I would take photos for Instagram and kind of talk about my nursing school journey. Well, my school uniforms were the brand Cherokee, which if you know me, then you know I worked with Cherokee for years and years and years. They're the biggest scrub brand in the world. And they had sent me a DM saying, hey, can we send you a free pair of scrubs 
in exchange for a photo where you tag us. And I about lost my shit. I didn't know anything about social media. I followed like a few big influencers, Amber Filler up being one of them. And I medical influencing also wasn't a big thing back then. It wasn't really common for nurses or doctors or medical influencers to really talk about their experience. Um, it just, it wasn't a thing back then because this was a, lo- a long time ago. Me aging myself, it wasn't that long ago. But this was like, almost 10 years ago. And I freaked out. I was like, free scrubs in exchange for a photo, say less. So they were like, okay, you have to make your Instagram public. And that kind of scared me because again, I only had 300 followers and I chose who could and couldn't follow me. And so that's what I did. And then throughout nursing school, I kept this relationship with Cherokee where they would just send me packages with free scrubs. And I would post in my scrubs so for years and years and years I only did content in exchange for product and the only company I really got product from was Cherokee they were the first company to really believe in me and the people that own Cherokee at the time are now basically family members to me they I cherish them with everything in me um not me first question, already wanting to cry. Deb Singer, I love you so much. And I feel like you deserve a special shout out because when I was 19 years old, you saw something in me that I never saw in myself. And you took a chance on me. And you tell me all the time till this day that I just had something, you know, I had the it factor or something that you saw without even knowing me or or meeting me. So Thank you. I owe you everything. And I tell you that all the time, but I love you so much. And Deb was a part owner in Cherokee and also ran their social media. And that's kind of how my social media journey got started. I was kind of forced, you know, to make my Instagram public, but it went somewhere and it was very slow. And I feel like that's another thing too, that people don't realize I've been doing this social media thing for almost a decade now and it wasn't until this July so maybe six months ago that I was able to stop working as a nurse and make a full-time living from social media and support my family and really create generational wealth which is insane to think about So that's kind of how I got started on social media was I would share my nursing school journey, then I shared my journey as a nurse. And then what ended up transitioning for me was I think mentally I've always struggled with confidence and I thought the only reason people wanted to follow me was because of my nursing journey. So then when I started sharing things like my skincare routine, which I was so passionate about, skincare is like one of my biggest passions and people would ask me about my skin and I was like, should I share my skincare? Like, oh, I shouldn't, like that's not nursing related. So I shared it and it did well. And then I started sharing like beauty things because I love makeup and then like my fashion outside of scrubs. And then I kind of transitioned to like my day in the life outside of working as a nurse. And then I kind of transitioned to motherhood But I think I wasn't quite ready to take that leap until this year when I was getting paid brand deals from companies outside of the medical field. And I was like, wow, people like me for me. And that was a huge, you know, switch in my brain that I really helped my confidence and I didn't feel like I needed to hide behind my scrubs anymore. So I don't know if I even answered the fucking question to be totally honest but yeah how did you get into social media okay that's kind of me 10 minutes later talking about that first question god this is gonna be a four-hour episode okay anyways wow that was scott's looking at me like okay bitch keep going um next question one of the most asked questions that i screenshot was asking if we're having more kids the answer is no Even if I wanted to have more kids, it would be very complicated because I got a tubal ligation after I had Stevie. And people are so taken back by this. And it's just kind of funny to me because 
I get so many opinions from other people. And I'm not talking about the people that are like, why don't you want any more kids? It's the people that kind of push having more kids on me. Like they're the ones having to grow them, birth them, breastfeed them, raise them, pay for them. I'm like, if I know I'm done, I'm done. Okay. I also think people see my content with my two littles, Ziggy and Stevie, and they don't see my content with all four of my kids because I keep my oldest two off the internet. They're, you know, teenagers now and I don't need them subjected to what people have to say about them or our situation. But four kids is a lot. And I also don't want to be stretched too thin where I can't give the kids the attention that they deserve because it is a lot. It's also different too when I know people have opinions about this, but I work crazy hours. Like I I was telling Scotty the other day, I woke up at 7 a.m. to start filming and I submitted my last ad at 1.30 in the morning that day. So there are days where I'm working like 12, 13, 14, 15 hour days. And it by no means would I ever complain about that from the career I came from and the money that I make. I mean, I'm blessed beyond measure. But I also, it's hard to keep up with, with two kids. And when we had Ziggy, David thought he was done. He was like, I had, you know, our girls before from his previous marriage. And, you know, he knew since, I mean, since I was little, 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 I knew I wanted to be a mom. And of course, I raised the girls half the time before we had Ziggy. And I loved it more than anything. But I also wanted to experience having my own child and being pregnant and also creating life with the man that I loved and or love. Sorry, I shouldn't say that past tense. He's going to watch this and be like, what the fuck? <laughs> um, but yeah, we had Ziggy and David was like, yeah, I think I'm I'm done. Like I'm tapped out. And what made us decide to have Stevie was the relationship between our oldest two daughters are so is so strong. Like they are truly just life partners together like they will always have each other and you know it was really hard every time the girls left our house for Ziggy even as a tiny tiny baby um he when he was probably like 15 to 18 months I mean he would just cry for days when they left our house to go back to their mom's house and David finally got to the point where he was like you know I don't think it's fair for our oldest two to have each other, but for Ziggy not to have anyone all the time. And so, and I'm a big like even number person. So I was like, I'm either going to have one more. So we have two or three more and have four. (laughs) And I don't think I could handle six kids. So we opted for one more, which was Stevie. And we knew it was our last baby, which was why I didn't find out her gender. I didn't want to be biased. I was like, if I have another boy, I don't want to have a, I don't want to feel pressure to have a girl. And, you know, just it, it, finding out the gender of your child is is a big deal, you know, and I feel like if I found out early, I would maybe ponder it. Like if it was a boy, I'd be like, oh, do I want like my own bloodline girl? But I just never felt that way. Like I knew I'd be happy either way. So I thought it'd be extra fun for our last baby to do a surprise gender. And so I signed the tubal ligation paperwork, like probably my first trimester of pregnancy. I knew that was it for me. And I have no regrets. People ask all the time, like, do you regret getting a tubal and not being able to have more kids? And my answer is no. I think my kids are everything I've ever wanted or needed in life. And we're just at such a beautiful stage in life. And I just wouldn't change anything. So no more kids. Tell us about the family you grew up in. Do you have siblings? What's your relationship like with your parents, siblings, etc.? So I have my parents, my mom and dad, which are, they are still married. I think they just celebrated 40, they're going to kill me. I think it was 43 years, but um, this December, well, we're in December now, we'll be 44. They're incredible. They were both teachers. Um, My parents both went to the University of Washington and 
um, got their master's. My mom got her master's in her undergrad in elementary education and then her master's in special education. My dad only became a teacher because my mom (laughs) was going to be a teacher. He studied um, math and he is like a freak genius. Like my dad is the smartest person I've ever met. And his IQ is off the charts. Like he is so intelligent and he was actually my high school math teacher. So, and I was a great student, so lucky him. But uh, yeah, my parents are both teachers. My mom taught mostly second grade, sometimes first grade. She did um, years doing special education as well. So I was always in her classroom. I feel like I just always loved kids and gravitated towards kids, which was another reason why I chose pediatrics when I was a nurse. But uh, yeah, my parents are amazing. They're actually in Europe right now. They're both retired now. So they go to Europe once a year and just like live out their travel dreams that they didn't get to do when, you know, they were busy working full time and raising my sister and I. So I have a sister. Her name's Taylor. Hi, Tay Tay. She is in the Navy, actually, and people don't really realize that. And also, they don't realize why she's not with me more often or like on my social media. They think we're not closer to have a relationship, but really, she's she lives in Georgia and she moves like usually every three to four years, depending on where she's stationed. But she'll be here for Christmas. She only gets a certain amount of leave. So. Yeah, if you're familiar with the military, then you know how it is. But she is five years older than me. And growing up, we just beat the shit out of each other all the time, as sisters do. But I love her so much. She is like the blonde version of me. And she's just such a hard worker. She joined the Navy at 18. So she gets to be out soon, which is crazy. She's going to be in her 30s, fully retired, not having any idea what to do. So maybe I'll hire her or something. (laughs) but yeah she's it's funny because my friends always tell me that I'm the funniest person that they know but my sister's so much funnier than me like if you met my sister you would just your stomach would hurt from laughing she's the best um and also we grew up in central coast california um san luis obispo area if you're familiar but my parents moved us out to arizona i was was i 12 I think I was 12 and my sister was 17 because she's five years older than me. And it was really hard. It was a hard age to move out here. I think just because 12 and 17 as girls, that's a rough age to move states. And so that was probably one of the most difficult times of like growing up in my family dynamic just because, you know, it's a big change. But I feel like every family struggled and and gone through things, but we got through it. My parents are still married and we're all doing great. And my kids are the only grandkids. My sister is not married and does not have kids, by the way. So that's why my kids get the shit spoiled out of them, (laughs) which is great because maybe they'll be a little bit older when my sister has kids and then she can take all the attention for her kids. (laughs) All right, let's see. Would love, love, love to hear about your nursing journey and advice to new grads and finding your peace in a chaotic career. So there's a lot of questions about my nursing journey, which I think, actually, I know we're going to do a dedicated episode for because I feel like I could just talk about it forever. But I loved my career as a nurse. I, I, I got a lot of questions too, asking if I miss it. I miss it every day. I truly feel like my passion in life was being a picky nurse and I just had so much career satisfaction and I just genuinely loved and enjoyed going to work every single day. I worked full time um, in the PICU until I came back from maternity leave with Stevie and then I went back um, just two days a week instead of three days a week. So I worked full-time in the ICU um, the majority of my career and I just, I, I truly loved it. I loved critical thinking. I loved my patients, my families. I always went above and beyond, but 
because I wanted to and I love to like you know for my vented patients they would always have fresh hair French braids mani pedi I found comfort in comforting parents you know during the hardest times of their life and I also don't think people realize the things that I've seen in the world and that's probably why I'm so jaded I think Dave and I are both maybe a little bit jaded which is probably normal for things that we've seen and experienced but you know I worked at a level one trauma and so we we saw some rough things we would we would get a lot of car accidents child abuse cases um drug overdose um well, a drowns are huge here in Arizona. I would get probably like a drown a week in the summertime because if you live in Arizona, you know how hot it is. We would have, we would get a lot of oncology patients, but only in their last, you know, few days or weeks of their life because they would be treated on the oncology floor. But if, if it was more towards end of life or they were really sick, then we would get them, you know, before they passed. So I just have a such a I have such a special place in my heart for nurses and David and I really want to start some sort of foundation for either you know pediatric patients or their families or you know I would love to maybe work with St. Jude or you know a first responder foundation just because you know these nurses and police officers and firefighters they see so much so much in the world that people just don't understand you know like this is my first Christmas off in seven years so David works on Christmas so we'll celebrate the day after you know there's a lot of sacrifices made but I just loved what I did as a nurse and obviously I transitioned to aesthetics and I loved that too I just feel like my passion was pick you and I worked you know, my last few years of working in the PICU was during the pandemic. So for two years, we worked through COVID and there was a time where my unit increased their age to 25-year-old patients. So we were getting adult COVID patients and I was pregnant the entire time um, during the first pandemic. So I remember being five days away from my scheduled C-section with Stevie, still working full-time, and I had two vented COVID positive patients that were both adults. And I was tired. I was just, you know, the full full PPE gear, my gown, gloves, N95, surgical mask, waddling around with a huge nine-month pregnant belly. But I was still there and I was still kicking it because I just I just loved it. And I, I feel very lucky where I worked on a unit with incredible doctors and nurses. It truly was like a family. But my last year working in PICU, things really changed because I came back from maternity leave and a lot of people left, you know, during the pandemic. We weren't treated well. I worked for a really large corporation that just honestly didn't give a shit about us and we had so many people in upper management that did not give a shit about us or the things that we saw and you know we didn't get a lot of support when it came to like mental support meaning like some of the things that we've seen like I still have dreams about some of the kids I took care of because it was so tragic and I feel like we just did not get the support that we should have gotten and you know it wasn't Arizona doesn't have unions and so I came from a union in California I started working at Rady Children's Hospital that was the first place I worked and I loved it so much so when I came to Arizona it was a lot different it was a whole different beast because I felt like the nurses did not get the support that they deserved and that's something I would also love hopefully in the future to maybe start something some sort of support for for nurses but that was a lot that was an earful but genuinely I loved working as a nurse and I miss it all the time I just have had different opportunities elsewhere and I feel like when I made the decision to leave nursing I had to 
think realistically, okay, can I last another 20 plus years doing this? You know, like my body was hurting. And I mean, these nurses that do this day in and day out for 30 plus years. I mean, I had worked with nurses that were working as a bedside nurse in the ICU for 40 years. That is insane. The toll it takes on your body, your mental health. Like I give so much props to those nurses. It's just insane. So anyways, hopefully that answered your question. I kind of forgot what the question was because I won't shut the fuck up. Okay. What was the reason behind the kids' names, Ziggy and Stevie? I love this question. I got this a bunch actually. So people always assume it's Ziggy Stardust. That's not why we named him Ziggy. I So going fast forwarding to Stevie's name, Stevie was actually going to be Ziggy's name if he was a girl, but he ended up being a boy and we found out his gender. And when we popped those balloons and it was blue confetti, I was like, I have no idea what to fucking name this kid. Like boy names are so hard. I don't know if other people feel like that, but I feel like boy names are so much more difficult than girl names. But we wanted to do some sort of dedication to David's grandfather, which if you listen to his episode, then you know how special he is to David. We, he, it's so funny because David is the last, was the last Woods name like existing after his grandfather died. So before Ziggy was born. So his grandpa was always like, you have to give me a boy. Like you have to give me a great grandson because our bloodline's going to die off. And it was so important for him to continue the Woods name and his grandfather's birth name was Jack. And I was like, we should do something like Jack, Jackson. He would sometimes go by John. So I was like, I don't know what to do. And then we were driving to the beach because we lived in San Diego at this time. And one of our favorite artists is from Australia. His name's Ziggy Alberts. I love him so much. He's incredible. And I saw his name on the screen and I was like, Ziggy, that's such a cool like surfer California kid name and because Ziggy was born in San Diego and David's from San Diego and he David was like yeah I really like that and I was like we should play on that with like David's grandfather's name and so we got to Jackson so I remember we were walking on the pier at the beach and we were like Ziggy Jack Ziggy John And I was like, it has to be longer because Ziggy is such a short name, which is funny because people think it's short for Zigford. No, his name is Ziggy, (laughs) not Zigford. So we were like, we were just bouncing stuff off. And then we got to Jackson and we were like, Ziggy Jackson. I love that. And then we kind of played around with the spelling of it. And so it's J-A-X-S-O-N. So that's Ziggy's name, Ziggy Jackson. Stevie is Stevie Lee because my dad's name's Steve and David's stepdad's name is Lee. So Stevie Lee Woods is how we came up with her name, which is both of our dad's names. So I love that. I thought it was very cool and sentimental and my mom gets jealous about it all the time. (laughs) All right. How did you grow on your platform and what made you decide to leave nursing? So I kind of talked about this a little bit, which I'm going to do a dedicated video on how I fully transitioned, but I, growing on my platform was just consistency and patience and time. It did not come fast by any means. I mean, like I talked about, I've been doing this since I was 19 and I'm turning 29 in April, so almost 10 years. And I just never gave up. I, There were so many times where I was like, what am I doing wrong? I've been doing this shit for like eight years and I'm like, is it even worth it anymore? Like, should I just focus on my career in nursing and not try on social media because I'm burnt out and I needed to work as a nurse to make a living for my family, but I also was making content, which took a lot of time on top of my three, 12, 13, 14 hour shifts a week, coming home to my kids, you know, up breastfeeding all night. 
and then making content it was a lot but I'm so glad I never gave up because our life now is so immensely different but we're so blessed and I'm able to work from home with my kids and just create so many different businesses and now employ people which is another thing that I will never get over so yeah that's kind of what happened all right how old were you when you got your boobs done and would you get it done pre-kids now as far as the pre-kids thing I would say it depends on your age no that's not true does not depend on your age. Depends on when you want to have kids. So if you're like, oh, I want to get pregnant next year, I would say definitely wait to get your boobs done because you're going to have to get them redone. If you get them done and you're like, oh, I want to wait at least another five-ish years, I'd say get them done. Like enjoy those five years of having great titties before your kids suck the life out of them. Um, But... Yeah, it just depends on when you're wanting kids. And it's funny because I have a really great friend that got hers done and actually preferred them after she had a child with implants because she really started with like no volume at all. And so when she got them done, they were a little too like perky and firm. And so she was like, once I got pregnant and they stretched a little bit and then I breastfed my kids, they really settled nicely I truly have no regrets getting my boobs done. I got them done when I was, what, when did I get them done? I got them done this year, but it was like literally a couple weeks before I turned 28. So I was 27, but again, I knew I was done having kids. No regrets at all. I got a couple questions about like the details of my boob job. I got a lift and implants and I, I was naturally very busty. I was like a 34 double D before I ever even had kids. My sister is like a 34 triple D. My family just has huge boobs. And so after I got pregnant for both my kids, I gained a ton of weight, which no regrets. Like your girl was living. She was eating. She was full constantly. And I loved it. If anyone gave me shit, my OB was like, I think you're getting too much weight. I said, mm. No, we're stopping at Cane's on the way home. Thank you. I just, my boobs were massive because I was just big in general overall, which ain't nothing but a number, honey. Then I breastfed my kids for a really long time. With Stevie, I breastfed her for 14 months. Ziggy, I think was like 11 months. So once my milk was gone, especially after Stevie, we're talking long skinny socks. We're talking the nipples were touching the belly button. It was terrifying. I knew I wanted my boobs done, but I was like so adamant about not getting a lift. I was like, I don't want a lift. I don't want the scar for it. But when I went to the consultation, my surgeon, who is amazing, by the way, was like, if you don't get a lift, it might look kind of weird because basically my boobs are so saggy that the implant would like sit kind of high and then I'd have all this extra breast tissue that was left over from having previously already big natural boobs so I ended up getting a lift which I tell everyone I am so happy I got it because I'm a big no bra kind of girly and I can wear anything and my boobs sit nice and natural they didn't have to do an anchor scar so I don't have any incision under my boob I only have one from the bottom of my nipple down so it's just one vertical line she was able to do a full lift and implant from that one incision so no regrets at all I know people are probably going to ask the cost my implants were nine thousand five hundred I think and then my lift was like four so I think I paid like no my my lift was five so I think I paid like a little under 15k best money I've ever spent literally best money I've ever spent and so thankful to have spent that money were you intimidated meeting David's ex sorry I'm in a very similar situation and would love to know don't be sorry. Ask away. I don't think I was intimidated. I, I don't really, I'm not like a, 
I don't really get intimidated easily. I feel like I, everyone's human and I was very nervous, I would say. And I wasn't nervous for any other reason other than I wanted to be liked. And that's something that I've definitely evolved from. I think most of my life I struggled with confidence and wanting to be liked by everybody. And it just doesn't have to be that way. Like people can like you, people don't have to like you. And I was nervous because I wanted maybe approval, even though I knew approval wasn't necessary because David and I shared a life together. We lived together before I even met her. So we had already been together for a while. I was already, you know, helping with the kids half the time before I ever even met her. So I knew whether she liked me or approved of me or not, uh, or not, David and I still shared this life together and had this family together already. So I think, you know, gosh, how long ago was this? 2014. 2014, Avery was nervous because I wanted to be liked. But 2023, Avery honestly doesn't care who likes her because, and social media has taught me that. Social media gave me some backbone because when you start posting your life for the public eye to see, not everyone's going to like you. Just as simple as that. But I'm going to keep doing me because if people don't like me, they don't have to watch me. But that's like for me as well. I'm not going to vibe with everyone, but I can choose who I want in my life and who I want to follow. So that was quite the evolving question. All right. Let's see. Explain how you make your marriage successful. Well, I would say... Obviously, every marriage is different. For David and I, quality time is very important. And, you know, it's really hard. You know, he works a full-time career. I obviously work a full-time career. We have little kids, which is really hard because at the end of the night, we're exhausted. And I'm like, I don't want to have sex. Like, I'm sorry. I'm so tired. I don't have anything to give. (laughs) But quality time is the most important thing for us, which is why every week we have a date night. It doesn't matter what week goes by, unless I'm traveling for work or something, but we have a date night every Wednesday, which we're so fortunate to have. We actually just started that like maybe a couple months ago because before we didn't have money for a sitter or even money for a date. We can go out to eat anytime we wanted, you know, life's changed a lot. And with my career evolving and taking off, and he's obviously really busy with his work And then we have the kids like we just need one day a week where we can connect and talk and I don't have to be on my phone or record and, you know, we can just kind of like catch up on our week. That's really important. And on, you know, if we're not able to go out for a date night or even on nights other than date night when the kids are in bed, we'll watch Great British Baking Show and order DoorDash and just like lay on the couch and cuddle, you know, I'll give them a back scratch and It's just that to us is the most important part of our marriage. And I feel like when we don't have that quality time, I feel not distanced, but I don't feel as like in tune or connected with him, which I think a lot of people can relate to. Like we're normal people. People think we have this like picture perfect marriage, but we work really hard at it every day. And we've gone through so much shit. Like we've gone through more together than people do in a lifetime. Like it's crazy. So it's just important for us to drown everything else out sometimes and just focus on the two of us. And that's how we can grow and evolve together. All right, next question. Let's see. Advice for someone wanting to start posting but is scared of people's opinions. I love this question because... I tell anyone, I'm like, if you are interested in social media at all, just do it. You literally have nothing to lose. The only thing I will say about it advice wise is make sure you are mentally okay to handle other people's thoughts and opinions because 
as sad as it is, when you don't ask, they're still going to give it, which sometimes can be bullshit, but that's just, you know, the name of the game. And anytime I have a hard time with this, I think about celebrities and by no means am I comparing myself to a celebrity. I, I literally pinch myself every day that someone even recognized me at Target or some shit. But I just think about like the small scale I am compared to some other celebrity or singer or actress that literally gets followed around with paparazzi and has all these nasty things said about them online. Like it is such a smaller scale compared to that. But like it is difficult and I think if you're tough or maybe just don't even read your comments to be totally honest with you protect your peace protect your peace but if you are passionate about it and you have something positive to say or positive to bring to the industry do it People think that there's like a capped number, like there's not room for them in the industry. There is, there's room for everybody. I mean, there are millions of creators. Like I swear every day I go on TikTok and I'll scroll and be like, oh my gosh, I love this girl's page. And I'll click and they have like 5 million followers and I've never seen them on my For You page in my life. Like there's an infinite amount of people. And I feel like if you have a voice and you're passionate about something or have like a realm of what you want to focus on then do it and I will be your biggest cheerleader can't wait to watch you oh my gosh what's the most rewarding part of being a mom this is a great question I I think oh my gosh there's so much to it but I'd say the most rewarding part is like when Ziggy or Stevie looks at me and they're like, I love you, mama. Or Ziggy will say I'm his best friend. Or just when they say thank you for like different experiences. Because it's not something I expect at their age. They're only five and two. But like when David and I go above and beyond to do something special, like, you know, and I say above and beyond. I, I This is not really above and beyond. We kind of just you know, try to create the best life for our kids. But like the small things like loading up in the golf cart and driving around looking at Christmas lights and getting hot chocolate. Ziggy's like, you're the best mommy. I love you, mommy. This is so fun. Like that to me is the most rewarding thing and fulfilling thing. And also just having happy kids. Like that's all I care about. And I feel like, again, you know, I'm so grateful for the experience I had working the PICU as a nurse because I, I've heard the cries of mothers, you know, as they hold their baby taking its last breath and the fact that I have the privilege to have two, actually four very happy and healthy kids and I'm able to give give them a great life. You know, there's days where I'm like, oh my God, I cannot wait for you to go to bed because it's just been a day. I really have to like take a step back and think, Like, you know, there are mothers that have empty beds in their kids' room, you know, and I I think about that every day of my life and that's something I'll carry with forever and like I will carry the experiences that I saw and the, the kids that I took care of in my heart forever and David will as well. I mean, there's been multiple calls that he's been on where he's doing chest compressions on a child and the things that I get to experience with my kids, not everyone gets to experience. And I just feel really grateful for that. So just the most rewarding part is the small things, you know, and, and just my kids joy. And that's all I care about. Nothing else matters but that. All right. Oh, this is a great question. Do you invest your money and would you mind sharing what in? So we do. And I also feel like that's a part of our life that we definitely don't really talk about or disclose, but it's, it's just, there is, you know, when there's unwanted opinions from people in your personal life or on social media, like, what are you going to do when social media ends? Well, I don't foresee that ever happening, to be totally honest with you, but there will always be something new, right? 
there was MySpace and Facebook and Snapchat and Twitter and Instagram and now TikTok. Like there's always something. But David and I try to be smart and I want to get to the point where I don't have to film, edit, and post three to five videos a day and also prepare for my kid's future. You know, we're, we have four weddings to worry about, four cars to buy our kids, four cell phones added to the cell phone plan. We got four kids that need braces. We got four college funds. So we try to prepare for that. We have um, a finance team that helps look at all of um, our income and put it into different accounts that grow over time with interest. Uh, Also, our retirement accounts. You know, I obviously don't naturally pay into retirement working on social media. I did as a nurse, but that money's been moved into a separate retirement account that our finance team handles. And then uh, as far as investing in businesses, yes, we are invested in certain businesses that we have personal connections to. So we have really close family friends that are huge entrepreneurs and investors and we were really lucky that they had great advice and they'll call when there's a business opportunity that comes up and we will invest X amount of money in those businesses and over time that money grows and then you can get a payout. So we're we're trying to be as smart as we can to make sure our future is set and that we can make sure that our family is taken care of. You know, I want my parents never have to worry about paying bills. I want to make sure my kids never stress about being able to have an education or, you know, small things like getting braces. Like that's, that's a huge privilege to be able to have braces. And I remember my parents got us braces because my mom's mom paid for it. My grandma bought us braces, you know, so I want to make sure I'm able to provide that for all my kids and also take care of my loved ones. And now my employees make sure everyone is taken care of. So yes, long story short, we do invest. What is something you wish you could have told your younger self? Oh gosh, I think it depends on the age because your girl's been through a lot and it probably depends on which stage of life I was in to say a different message. But I would say believe in yourself and I just always lacked confidence and it kills me inside. And I wish I just would have like, I could grab myself by the shoulders and shake myself and be like, look at you, look at you in the mirror. You're a hot little bitch you are smart, you are educated, you have a great career. I just, I wish I could tell her to believe in herself and to realize that in life, what matters is being kind and being a good human being. And it doesn't matter what other people think about you because not everyone's going to like you. And again, that's, that's something I struggled with for so long where I just... I always just wanted everyone else's approval and I wanted to be liked so bad by so many people and it just didn't matter. I should have just, you know, focused on myself and making sure that I was making good decisions for myself and the people around me and just being a good, kind-hearted human being. All right, let's see. How much longer does it genuinely take for you to do things when you are vlogging? So... This is a great question because in the moment, nothing but a few extra seconds usually. And I film my vlogs in super long clips. So I would say it's usually like a morning vlog. I usually probably have a total of like 45 minutes of footage. And what I do is I just put my phone on my tripod and go about my day, go about my morning, whatever I'm filming, morning vlog, evening vlog, afternoon vlog, whatever it is. And I just move the tripod around like the kitchen area, living room area, upstairs, 
So it literally just takes a few seconds to move the tripod. The time consuming part is editing, which people don't see that behind the scenes. Because if you're filming three videos a day or ads on top of that, it's the editing that takes hours. And I usually don't edit until my kids are in bed. So I usually go to bed pretty late because I'll lay in bed and edit. So that way I'm off my phone when I'm present with my kids. And that is the time that takes a long time. I would say, I mean, I've gotten it down pretty quick now because I'm faster at using the editing apps. But as far as filming, it doesn't really take any extra time. Did your family slash friends judge you when you first started social media? If so, how did you deal? I would say any family or friends that judged me or said anything are no longer in my life. But I would say directly to my face, not really. There's like the side remarks here and there of like, well, what are you going to do when TikTok is over? What are you going to do when you know, you get older and brands don't want to work with you. Just comments like that that just don't make sense to me because I would never say that to anybody. But you know what's very interesting to me is when word gets back to me about what people say about me and people don't ever think that happens, but it does. And the biggest thing I can, well, no, not the biggest thing I can say about it. The thing that I've noticed is the people that like to talk the most shit are to my husband because any instance where they talk shit about me, they, I don't know if jealous is the right word, but they want their wives to earn money. And so they say not so nice things about me to David but David always tells me about it. So it's kind of funny to me. But again, I I just don't get that. I'm just not that kind of person. And I would just never do that to someone and talk about their spouse like that. What's your favorite alcoholic beverage? I'm so glad you asked. So my address is, just kidding. <laughs> I'm like, send me some bottles after that last question. What is your favorite alcoholic beverage? It is Kim Crawford Sauvignon Blanc. And I just discovered... It's Sauvignon Blanc, not Blanc. I've been saying it with the C, but apparently the C is silent. So that's my favorite beverage. I am just such a big wine bitch through and through. Like if I go out to eat, I would say I definitely will order like a mixed drink, like drink a cocktail or something fun. But I don't know. I just truly enjoy the taste of wine and I've been loving learning about wine and like pairing wine with the correct foods to really bring out that flavor. But also with Arizona being so hot, I feel like that's why I love a Sauvignon Blanc because it's very refreshing. Oh gosh, who's the person you look up to the most? Oh, that's a rough question. Scott's looking at me like, um, me? Scott is one of them actually, which we're going to do an episode on Scotty. Because his story is so inspiring and just he's been through so much as someone who grew up in such a strict Mormon household and as a very confident gay man that he is now. I mean, he's come so far, but gosh, the person I look up to the most I would say my sister's definitely up there. My sister struggled with a lot of, you know, mental health battles and just trying to find herself as a teenager and didn't really have, didn't really have, I wouldn't say motivation, but she didn't really know what she wanted to do with her life. And the fact that she joined the military, now she's a lifer in the military is huge. So yeah, I would say my sister is up there also David like that's so hard I have so many people I could say David's a big one because again he overcame so much with his family's addiction problems that the fact that he's just such a present father and husband and family man and career oriented and 
a leader in his workplace. He really, he really is one of the most inspiring people in my life. How long did you wait to have sex after your C-section? So glad you asked. I, so clearance is eight weeks. So if you have, if you give birth vaginal, it's six weeks. I think it's six weeks clearance and C-section's eight weeks. I think I waited like seven. Other, other favors were given (laughs) to David, David, as we call him. But I think I waited seven weeks, but I will be totally honest. I could not enjoy anything without pain for probably months. And other C-section moms understand this, but it's the pressure of the incision because, I mean, they're cutting through layers and layers of skin and tissue and... Just they're literally opening up your abdomen to pull a child out. So I would say it took me a couple months to actually enjoy it. But yeah, I'd say like seven weeks. Okay, we're running out of time, but I feel like I should answer my last question of what my birth stories were. And I love that question because I love talking about my birth stories. I... Ziggy's did not go as planned at all, which is why I always tell people like you can have a rough general birth plan, but don't count on anything because it probably won't go that smooth. I so if you don't know, David is six foot five and he was born almost 14 pounds. Yeah, he was like 13 pounds, six ounces. And I was almost 10 pounds, I believe I was like nine, five or something. And we're both very tall. He's six five. I'm five nine. So they were already starting to do weekly anatomy scans on Ziggy because of our size. And they were starting to realize that Ziggy's head was ginormous. I think it was measuring like 42 weeks when I was like 37 weeks pregnant. And so because it was my first child, they were like, we should probably induce you early if you want to have a vaginal birth. And I went into it, I said, no medication, all natural, this baby's just going to slide right out of me, it's all good. That didn't happen. That did not happen. Poor sweet Avery. So they induced me at 39 weeks. They maxed me out in Pitocin. I had three cervical Foley balloons, no epidural for 43 hours. Yes, you heard that right over 40 hours. And then Ziggy started becoming bradycardic, which is when his heart rate drops because he was in so much distress because I was maxed on pit and I was laboring for so long. And so they said emergency C-section. So 43 hours of that much pain just to have a (laughs) C-section. So they really quickly gave me an epidural and I signed the paperwork as they're rolling me back and he was born. And it's funny because, well, not really funny. His head was so big that sweet David was trying to like take a cute birth video and I'm literally yelling in it. My ribs are cracking because my OB was standing on a stool and was pushing with all of her weight to try to get his head to pop out but his head was so big it wouldn't come out. So they cut me all almost all the way to my hip bone on the right side. So he would come out and she still couldn't get him. And so in walks this sweetest but like huge dude because she was like, I'm not big enough to like have enough weight to push him out. So this guy walks in and goes, I'm here to help. And literally gets on a stool and puts all of his weight on my rib cage to pop Ziggy's head out. And then he was out. Now, and honestly, it wouldn't change a thing. He was healthy. I was healthy. That's all that matters. And they were so sweet because they let me hold. Oh, here's the other thing too. Because I got an epidural and not a spinal. I felt so much of it. Like I moved myself onto the OR table. It was one of the most painful experiences of my life. But I remember them laying him on me as they were sewing me up. And I remember that like, 
like moms know what I'm talking about. You get like a high. Like when you give birth, you feel like high from oxytocin. Is that right? I think it's oxytocin that I didn't feel a thing. Like once they placed him on me and I saw him and met him, like I remember just not feeling anything anymore, like no pain at all. And then with Stevie, she was an even bigger baby. And they were like, do you want to try VBAC like, or a scheduled C-section? We'll support you either way. I said, I'm going to go with a scheduled C-section because I'm not doing that shit again. Especially because she was five ounces bigger than Ziggy was. So that was an incredible experience. I always tell people, if you can have a scheduled section, like it's pretty dope. I swear to God, I walked myself in the OR. They gave me a spinal. I was breastfeeding nine minutes later in the recovery room. That's how fast it was. By the time I walked in, gave me a spinal, laid down, she was born. David told me the gender. It was magical, amazing. They lay on my chest. I was breastfeeding in nine minutes. I mean, it was like, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. I'm a mother of two. It was incredible. I don't know how, but that was already an hour of questions, and I feel like I answered like 5% of them. So we will definitely do more of these, and we're going to do more dedicated episodes, maybe about motherhood or quitting nursing for social media. We have so many things we could talk about because we need more solo episodes on here. I'm kind of digging this. Scotty, you think? Absolutely. Yeah, Scotty's loving it. Well, I love you guys. Thank you so much for listening, watching, being here. You guys are my biggest supporters, my best friends, my family. I'm just so grateful that you're here. So I love you so much and we'll see you on the next episode. Cheers.